I'm not Proverbs, but First Samuel chapter 30 in just a moment. Let me ask you a question. I know the answer, but I just feel like I need to ask you. Do you ever get discouraged? Have you been discouraged ever in your life? <laughs> and does it seem to happen more than once? We uh, had the baby dedication this morning, and, and parents, oftentimes they see the, the little things in their own kids that maybe nobody else knows, things that may discourage them from time to time. Maybe, maybe a parent has a child who's maybe just not, not and not responding the right way when they correct them, or maybe a, maybe a, you got grown children and you're discouraged about the way the the kids turned out after your big plans, and, and sometimes uh, it's discouraging when you have children and maybe a maybe a spouse uh, left the other spouse all alone to care for the kids all by themselves, and now they have to be mom and dad both, and, and maybe it's your health. You know, sometimes you can have health that's just a constant literal pain and you get so tired going through pain you just you just feel like what can I do you know and it's discouraging and I guess there's a hundred thousand things that can discourage us and I want to preach tonight on the subject from first Samuel chapter 30 of rising from the ruins of discouragement Rising from the ruins of discouragement. You'll remember this story, but boy, there's a, a mountain of lessons in this to help us along the way. In <clears throat> chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag with, and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein and slew not any either great or small but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David, notice this, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abithar the priest, Abimelech's son, I pray thee bring me hither the ephod. And Abithar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as we look into the precious word. Lord, we do get discouraged. And everything is not a bed of roses. Sometimes we hurt on the inside, on the outside, and sometimes both. And Lord, we just pray that you'd help us tonight to find encouragement from the word of God to continue on and not just survive but Lord to thrive in the midst of the trials tribulations and the heartaches and the pains that we may experience Lord I pray that you'd bless us tonight show us from the precious word of God how to have victory and we'll thank you for it in Jesus name amen and uh, <laughs> you you know the story David has uh, David has brought his men back from being over in Philistia and which is enemy territory. He's not even supposed to be there. He's an Israeli. And his men are all Hebrews. And they're hobnobbing with the enemy in Ziklag. Ziklag is a city that uh, the, uh, the ruler, the Philistine ruler, had given David there because 
David was on the run from Saul. You remember King Saul was after him and, and constantly chasing David, trying to kill him. We all need encouragement from time to time. and Sometimes it just seems like everything is falling apart. The wheels are coming off. And this is the way it was for David. And like David, sometimes you might just feel like saying, man, is this what I get for trying to do right? Well, in times of stress, our load sometimes just seems heavier than we can bear. The task is more than we can handle. And there can also be times of fear when every sense of our security seems to be threatened and we don't know which way to turn. David at this point is not yet king of Israel. Uh, he's been anointed privately by Samuel the prophet to be king of Israel, but he's not king yet. And Saul has become very jealous of David, and Saul is pursuing David all over the desert. And as David tires of running from King Saul, he goes all the way to the land of the Philistines, and King Achish gives David this little village, this town, small city, by the name of Ziklag. And it's in enemy territory, but David's made friends with the enemy. And you better be careful when you start trying to make friends with the enemy. It can lead you in the wrong direction. Who would have thought David, the great warrior David, who would have thought he would ever compromise and be living now in the land of Philistia, hobnobbing with and even fighting beside and for the king of Gath? Well, that's the case. <clears throat> in fact, David has had his whole troop of men, about 600 of them. They've been over in, uh, in the capital city and the Philistines are about to go back to war with David's own home country, Israel. And David offers to take his men and go with the Philistines and fight against Saul and his homeland. And thank God for his grace, he, he uh, somehow instilled in the mind of the Philistines that that they ought not to allow David to go because after all, he is a Hebrew. And after all, in the heat of battle, he could decide to become a turncoat and fight against the Philistines instead of against Israel. And so they vote. A lot of the leaders get together and they say, if he's going, we're not going. And so David gets left behind and his men. They don't get to go. They're expelled from the Philistine army. And so when they're expelled... Those guys, with their tail tucked between their legs, they begin to march back to Ziklag, their headquarters. They're in Philistine country still. And so they're, they're marching back. They're tired. They're weary. They're discouraged because they've been expelled from the only army who seemingly would have them. And as they come over the hill and look down on Ziklag, man, the smoke's coming up. The blazes are still going and the, the fire's still smoldering. All the... All the the cattle pens are burned down. The buildings are burned. and It's just a mess. Nothing but rubble. And they run down there and see if anybody's left. And nobody's there. Their wives are gone. Their children are gone. Their cattle's gone. All of their possessions. Everything is gone. David needed some encouragement. And in the midst of a great distress, it says in verse 6, but David encouraged, he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That sounds great, doesn't it? But what does it really mean that David encouraged himself in the Lord? Sometimes events happen to make us stronger. I would like to have that ability when I under, undergo disappointments, discouragements, defeats, heartaches, pains. I'd like to have that ability to just be encouraged even though these things are happening, wouldn't you? I'd like to stay encouraged. So let's see if we can see from this passage of Scripture how David went about encouraging himself. This band of Amalekites, have, they have swooped in while David and his men are gone. They, they swooped in, stole their families, stole their animals, and took everything and left the place burning. And so I guess we'd ask the question, what do we do? And what did David do when he saw his whole life falling apart? On top of everything else? I mean, look, David, David is suffering about as bad as anybody there. He's lost his family. He's lost his kids. 
He lost his house. He lost his cattle. The only thing David had left was what he was wearing on his back. He was in as big a trouble as anybody. And on top of that, wouldn't you know it, his own men said, let's just stone David. <laughs> let's, let's hack the leader to pieces. We'll get even with him. This is all his fault. And some of them sat down and they, they just wept. The Bible says they, they shed tears till they had no more power to weep. And the rest of them said, we're tired of crying. Let's just beat David up. It says in verse number 6, And David was greatly distressed. Well, I guess I'd be distressed too. It says, For the people spake of stoning him, <laughs> because all the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You know, it's always easy to look for somebody else to blame when we end up hurting that's what these men did. David's in the same pickle as they are, but they turn on him. It's like, let's just stone him. When we hurt, we're tempted to take it out on somebody else. And when people hurt, they tend to hurt others. Misery loves company. Yet in the pit of this despair, instead of spending time with God, and figuring out what God's plan might be, the people say, let's just stone David. <clears throat> so they get through this crisis, as we'll see in a little while, and then another one comes up. Isn't it strange when you get through a crisis, there's usually another one waiting for you down the road somewhere? And when we act like these men acted towards their leader, and we hurt other people around us, then when that crisis is passed, we find ourselves trying to rebuild the bridges we burned and rebuild the fences that we knocked down. And so then we've got a whole other problem. Think of what must have been going through David's mind as he stood over the ruins of his home and saw nothing. He's probably, before they say they're going to stone him, he's probably thinking... Well, why is this happening to me? I mean, after all, is this what I get for being the man after God's own heart? Why is Saul so insanely jealous over me? I've always been good to Saul. Why is he trying to kill me? Why am I hiding out here? And why do I get this kind of a reward for trying to do right? Have you ever felt that way? Man, I, I was trying to do right. I was trying to witness to people. I was trying to give. I was trying to attend church. I was trying to do everything right. I was trying to be good to people. And then all of this happens. Well, that's what happened to David. But let's ask ourselves this question. Is it possible that God allows things to happen like this, like it happened in the life of David, for a purpose? David had a choice. He could stand there and just continue to look at the smoke curling up from the ruins. And he could look at those men who said, let's stone David. He could look at them and become bitter about that. Or he could look beyond them and see God. David looked deep within himself and he discovered God while he was there. And some things changed. In verse number 6 it says, but David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. We find a, an eloquent but there, but David. I like the way God throws those conjunctions in every once in a while. And it looks like things are going this way, but God got involved and things changed. There's one thing that the Amalekites couldn't take away from David. And that was his relationship with God. Although David could no longer say, my house, my family, my herd, my stuff. He couldn't say that anymore, but he could say, my God. That couldn't be taken away. And friend, when you're going through hurt, remember that your relationship with God, nobody, not even the devil himself, can take away. David was able to encourage himself and strengthen himself because he had a personal relationship with God. Alexander McLaren, an old preacher from the past, said this, 
Whatever else we lose, as, <coughs> as long as we have him, we are rich. And whatever, whatever else we possess, we are poor as long as we have him. God is enough. Whatever else may go. David encouraged himself in the Lord. There's nothing passive about what David did here. He had a talk with himself and a talk with God, and he said, we, we're going to do something. We can't just stand here and look at what's ruined. Something needs to be done. He kind of got himself by the shirt collar. You ever do this, have a talk with yourself, grab yourself by the shirt collar and say, hey, bud, it's time to straighten up. <laughs> David got himself by the shirt collar and said, look, <laughs> we got to do something. We can't just stand here and look. As the psalmist said in 43 verse 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Rise from the ruins of discouragement. How can we do that? Three things. Number one, get guidance from God. Get your guidance from God. Make sure God is directing you in about what you're going to do. And we'll see how that happened right here. But let me just say at the beginning, make sure it's God directing you. Make sure your guidance comes from God. I, I, I can't help but repeat the story about the woman who <laughs> had a mean husband and he'd mistreat her and abuse her and talk awful to her, treat her nasty. And, and her neighbor lady was over visiting with her one day and she said, boy, your husband treats you bad. How, how do you put up with it? She said, oh, I, I find encouragement by cleaning my toilet. She said, cleaning your toilet, how does that help? She said, I use my husband's toothbrush. <laughs> now, I don't think that was God's plan. <laughs> but God has some guidance for us. God has guidance. Verses 7 through 10 in our text, it says, And David said to Abithar the priest. Now look here. The first thing he does is go to the man of God. He says, And David said to Abithar the priest of Himelech's son, I pray thee, Bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, God, answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now when David sent for the priest and the ephod, he's going to inquire of God. I don't think he did that now when he... When he went over to live in the land of the Philistines, I don't think he was getting God's guidance there. But this time he's saying, before I do anything else, I better get God's input on this. And they had a, a technique, biblical, you can read about it in Exodus. The, uh, the priest had a, an ephod. It was kind of like an apron, you know, like your husband wears when he's barbecuing out back like my Razorback one. Uh, he's got, it's kind of like an, ap an apron over the neck and over the shoulders, and it had stones on the breast of it and came down lower. And those stones were part of what they called the Urim and the Thummim. And they could get in touch. In the Old Testament, they got in touch with God through the Urim and the Thummim and uh, the ephod. Now, if you wonder how all of that came about using the ephod and the Urim and the Thummim, ask Brother Jonathan Atkinson after church is over, and he'll give you in detail how that happened. <laughs> I don't have a clue. Maybe he does. <laughs> but David, look, David said, we better get in touch with God before we do anything. It's time to do something, but before we go off on our high horse, we better find out what God has to say about this. And so he got the advice from God's man because he had violated God's explicit will for being over in the land of the Philistines in the first place. Now he gets clear instructions because he went to God. When you're down and out, is your first response? You say, boy, I better do some reading. I better do some praying. I better go get some counsel from somebody that knows something about this. Another Christian who is a seasoned Christian. And that's what David did. And God said, pursue. Go after them. Now how would David know that they're going to 
be victorious because God said to pursue and God said you're going to recover all. Well, that's God's promises. You know this book's got a lot of God's promises in it. And when you're, when you're having problems, when you're having questions, when you're having hurts, when you're discouraged, God's promises will be there to rescue you. God said, you're going to recover everything. And David took God at his word. See, you've always got, in this New Testament time, we don't have a Urim and a Thummim. We don't have the priest and the ephod. But what we do have is we have the word of God. We have the indwelling spirit of God. And we have the counsel of God's men just, just like God planned. We have a trinity of help in this. <laughs> David said, it's not good just to sit around and sometimes we just sit around and say, well, I'm just going to trust the Lord out of, uh, for this thing. I'm discouraged, but I'll just trust the Lord. Well, David, didn't, he wasn't content just to sit around and trust the Lord. He's going to trust the Lord, okay, but he's going to do something. He's going to take it to action. Look, when you get instructions from the Word of God, when you get instructions from God's Spirit, when you get instructions from some counsel, and you're sure this is the way to go, then don't sit and pray about it any longer. Get up and go and do something about it. Take the instructions that you've got and be willing to act on what God said. Now these men were ill prepared to go to battle or to chase this troop of Amalekites that's kidnapped their families. They just marched back from the Philistine stronghold of King Achish. They've just got back. They're weary. They're tired. They've already been marching. They've already lost sleep. Man, this has gone too far. They're ready and now they've lost their families and all their stuff. They'd probably like to just lay down and cry themselves to sleep. They're not prepared but God said go. And so since he said go David rallied the men around and said let's go. They might have said now how do we know we're going to win this? David said because God says so and that's all that counts. <laughs> well David's plan to run down the Amalekites didn't seem all that promising. And sometimes when you're discouraged and you follow the instructions that God's given you to be encouraged, you might not find that it's working out immediately the way you wanted. But wait, God doesn't always do things on our timetable. They take off. They're roused to action. They're chasing the Amalekites. And so they're on their way. They, they march 15 miles and they reach the brook Besor. Look in verse number 9 again in our text. <laughs> said, so David went, he and the 600 men that were with them, and uh, came to the brook Besor where those that were left behind stayed. And so there's this creek. And when they get there, we got a group of men that says, man, we, <laughs> we're wore out. We'd like to go on, but we, we can't. We just can't move another step. We're frazzled. We can't go on. And David says, well, you stay here, and we'll leave our stuff here. Uh, stuff is a Hebrew word. <laughs> he said, leave your stuff. We'll leave our stuff here, and you guys that can't go on, I, I understand you're, you're weak and you're weary and you're hurting. You stay here by the stuff and guard it. Because if, if they didn't have somebody guard their stuff, guess what? Some other, some other group would come along and pillage that and carry that off. So this group of 200 stays behind there at the brook. And so how do we rise from the ruins of discouragement first? Well, first of all, we get God's guidance on the matter. Find out what God wants us to do. And number two, remember that the Lord provides. He said he'd bring them to recover everything. Did he say that? He did. And so if God said that, is it going to come to pass? Yep. You bet. And so remember that the Lord provides. When you're, when you're trying to dig yourself out of despair and discouragement and hurt and pain, get God's guidance. And as you do then, as you go along your way to answer His call to do whatever He tells you to do, then remember along the way that God is able to provide. Where God guides... God provides. So the remaining 400 men crossed over the brook and they pushed on to the desert land where 
the Amalekites had gone. But David's men weren't able to find any trace. I mean, I can just see, you've seen the old cowboy movies, you know, they've got, they get down off their horses and they look in the sand and they say, man, we've lost our trail. Can't find anything. Well, they've been following them, but they can't seem to find them. And sometimes you're that way when you're trying to dig your way out of despair. You're trying to encourage yourself. You kind of lose your way. But remember that God provides. In a seemingly small and insignificant incident, they discover a man comes into their camp, an Egyptian. In verse number uh, 11, it says, And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came to him again, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water for three days and three nights. Well, he'd about, he about had it. <laughs> you can go more than three days without food, but three days without water and you're just about done. That's all she wrote. Well, he's, he's ready to eat and drink. And then it says his spirit came to him again. And verse 13 says, And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Carathites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. Aha! <laughs> He's been with the crowd that burned their city and stole their people and their cattle. I bet, he's, I bet he's got their ear now, don't you? Let's see what else it says. Verse 15. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear to me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. This Egyptian boy had been a servant to one of the Amalekites, and when he got sick, they threw him to the side. They said, He's not worth anything to us anymore. He's sick. We can't have him tagging along. We're not going to waste food and water on him. He's going to die anyway. So they just threw him away and left him in the desert. I bet that Egyptian boy didn't have a lot of allegiance left in his heart for the Amalekites. And so he's willing, he's willing to spill the beans because he's been with them through their pillaging and burning of Ziklag and they got all of their stuff. The Amalekites are headed back away from the land to go and celebrate their great victory of spoils. And so this Egyptian boy knew exactly where they're going and he knew where they're going to throw the party. And so he spills the beans to David and his men. They left him behind to die in the desert. Now he's used by God to give these men the instructions, the directions that they need. You know, if David hadn't have been kind to this young Egyptian boy, he would have missed God's provision. Are you listening to me? Sometimes if we are mean and nasty to those around us who may be trying to help us, we may miss God's provision. Sometimes it comes from somebody who may be like this old boy. He's been sick. He's not worth anything, the Amalekites think. And they throw him away. But boy, was he valuable to David and his men. And because David was kind to him, David got the information he needed. So once the Egyptian revived, he tells David everything he needs to know. And here's what it says in verse 16 of our text, chapter 30. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread, the Amalekites, the bad guys, so they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. These guys have been, they've been robbing and pillaging everywhere they went. And so they're having a big party. I mean, they're having such a party that, and they think they have, they have gotten completely away out of the land where they would be pursued. And so they feel really safe and they don't even have a lookout posted watching for them. They're just all down there getting drunk and having a big time. And David and his men come upon them unawares. It says, and, 
And David smote them, verse 17, and David smote them from the twilight even to the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken from them. David recovered all. Isn't that what God said he would do? God said you'll recover, pursue, you'll recover all. And here, the end of the story. They recovered all. And so, when David and his men come up on these Amalekites, man, they're spread out down there without any lookouts, without any guards, and they're like sitting ducks. And by the next day, they were dead ducks. And David recovered everything. The recovery was complete. Plus, not only did they get all their stuff back that was taken from Ziklag, they recovered a bunch of booty that was taken from Judah. So they got a bunch of extra stuff on top of all that. David and his men return in triumph. So what's the application to that story? Well, don't quit on God. Don't quit on your family. Don't quit on your church. Don't quit on your job. Don't quit on your hopes and dreams and your calling. Pursue until God has you to recover all. God often brings victory and blessing later than we expected. When Joey, I think the first time he visited here, I used a, an illustration, and I won't go through the whole thing, uh, but how I had come to a point in my life of being mistreated pretty badly in a church that I belonged to at one time many, many years ago. And I come to the brink of thinking, you know, I'm going to quit. I won't just quit believing, but I'll just quit serving. And I'll find me a little church somewhere where I can just go and sit on the back row, mind my own business, and nobody will bother me. I won't bother to preach, and I won't bother to teach. I'm not going to witness to anybody. I'm not going to do anything, but I'll just, I'll sit in church because that's my duty, you know. <laughs> I'd come to the point where I'm about ready to relegate myself to just being the most minimal Christian possible. And somehow in that despair, God came and got a hold of my heart. And in that despair, Aaron was just a little tyke. We're talking about little babies this morning and toddlers. Aaron was a toddler. He come out of the house as I was sitting out there crying in my iced tea. And he's just having a good time. He's coming out. And I see him coming towards me. And I thought, now if I quit, what am I going to tell him? If I quit, what will I say someday when he comes and says, hey, Dad, weren't you a preacher one time? What will I say? Well, I'm glad I didn't quit. Got him serving in the ministry here with me. You know, we can't. Quit. I told that story the first time Joey Corbett and his family visited here. Joey says that, that struck a, a note with me. I felt like I was right on the verge of just quitting on God. And I saw that you were at the same place and you got over it. And Joey's sitting back there serving God now. It's a blessing. How to rise from discouragement. Seek God's guidance. Seek God's provision, knowing that He's promised. But let me give you a third one now. We would think kind of that the story is over right here. <laughs> but there's one more element we need to consider. Be a channel of God's grace. Number three, be a channel of God's grace. The crisis was over, but it was replaced by another. Verse number 20. David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before the other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David, and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men, and men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught 
of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man his wife and his children that they may lead them away and depart. They said, hey, these guys that went to the battle, now thank God they went to the battle. But when they got back to the brook and those guys that stayed by the stuff because they weren't able to move on, they stayed there and guarded the stuff. And the guys that did go to battle came back and said, we ain't splitting nothing with those guys. They can go to thunder. They could have gone with us. But David understood that they weren't able. And so here's what David did in verse number 23. Then David said, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us, and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. David said, look, you're not going to cheat these guys out of the reward. We're a team. Yeah, some of us went up to battle. Some stayed behind to guard the stuff. And those guys that guarded the stuff did an important job. They did everything that they were able to do. You guys did what you were able to do. And we're splitting it, even Stephen. Not going to cheat those guys. He said, what right have you got to talk about your stuff? The Lord gave this stuff to us. It's not your stuff and you have no right to take away the stuff that the Lord gave all of us. It was a gift from God. This is nothing but the grace of God and we don't have the right to deny them the grace of God. And Everything that they had was of sheer grace. And David would see to it that they treated one another with that same grace. Can I just say to you that not everybody preaches from the pulpit, but those who pray for the preacher that's preaching, they stayed by the stuff, and they deserve just the same reward. Hey, sometimes we think somebody maybe that's, out, out in the forefront more, maybe in the spotlight more, maybe that one will get more rewards. I, I would submit to you that we've got people who are praying in the background that will get greater rewards than your preacher. There's people who witness privately, never say anything. Of, Boy, I won three to the Lord this week. <laughs> they never say that. They just quietly witness. And when they do win somebody, you may not even hear about it. But let me say that they will have an equal reward. And those who may not be able to go out and walk up and down the street, knock on the doors, but they're willing to keep a nursery or babysit the smaller children while their parents go. Do you think those who stayed behind to see after the kids, should they not receive a reward the same as those who went? Of course. We're not all gifted the same way. We don't all have the same abilities. We don't always have the same exact opportunities. But thank God for those who are willing to stay by the stuff and do what they can. When Earl Sutton sat over there, he told me the the Sunday he asked me about joining the church. He said, Preacher, I'm nearly 90 years old. And he said, I'm too old to do anything. I can just barely walk in and out of the church house. He said, I'd like to join the church, but I won't be worth a plug nickel. (laughs) That was his words. He said, I won't be worth a plug nickel. I said, Brother Earl, every time I look over there and see you sitting there on Sunday morning, you had the wherewithal to get out of bed and come to church at your age. You're a very valuable part of this church. Thank God for those who stay by the stuff. People like that probably pray for you. And would we deny them a reward? David said, you're not going to do that. He called them wicked, wicked people. Not everybody goes to the mission field. But there's some who quietly give to faith promise mission giving. And they pray for the missionaries. Maybe they write them a card once in a while to encourage them. Would we deny them a reward of part of what the missionary accomplishes on the field? According to David's philosophy, and which I believe is the Lord's philosophy, I think we wouldn't deny them a reward. They stayed 
by the stuff. Everybody has some gift of God. and Everybody ought to do something. That's true. I think everybody can pray. I think everybody can read their Bible. Everybody can encourage others in the church. Everybody can do something. Everybody can't do the same thing, but everybody can do something. And everybody that's part of this church, you're doing something. I say you deserve a reward. And whether I thought that or not, I think God would give you one regardless of what I or anybody else thinks. I was too little to throw hay bales when I was 12 years old up on the top of the wagon. We'd haul hay. It's one of the, the only way we could earn money when I was a teenager and a little bit younger, uh, we could either catch chickens at night, got paid $3 a night for being up all night from midnight till 6 o'clock in the morning, or we could haul hay. And I tried to be as strong, I tried to be as stout as those bigger boys. I was 12 years old and scrawny. I wasn't big and muscular like I am now. That's not the place to laugh. And we'd be in the hay field. I mean, talking about 95, 100 degree weather. And we're, uh, D. Wolf was, he'd bailed all the hay and he hired a bunch of us boys to come and haul the hay back into the barn. He had a wagon he pulled behind that tractor And, I mean, they'd load that baby down. (laughs) And when they got the hay this high, I couldn't reach any higher. I just couldn't do it. I was too little, too short, too skinny, too weak. (laughs) But I'd throw the bales till we get up about that high, and I couldn't do any more. Those taller boys and the bigger boys and the stronger boys, man, they'd get them and throw them up there. They'd send them up there like a Frisbee. And they'd stack that hay wagon. I don't know, it seemed to me like it was 20 bales high. But they'd load that baby down. But when it got that high, you know what? I felt kind of like Earl Sutton. I wasn't worth a plug nickel when I got to that point where I couldn't put them up any higher. D. Wolf knew. He, he watched. And he knew I was too little to do any more. You know what D. Wolf would do? He'd say, hey, Rick, how about you drive the tractor for a while? Now, he was... Not an old man, but he was driving the tractor most of the time because he was the senior farmer, the owner, and he'd get to drive the tractor. But when he saw me struggling, he'd say, Rick, you drive the tractor for a little while. I'd never driven a tractor pulling a load of hay behind it like that. And his farm was on hills. I mean, those hills were higher than the ceiling of this and just round and steep. And so he he put me to driving the tractor to rescue me from having to try to throw those bales I couldn't reach any higher. And when I come to a hill, the, the hay bales were in a row going up that hill. And so I was driving the tractor right up that hill. Man, it looked like I was going straight up in the sky. <laughs> and, and we're going up that hill, and I get almost to the top of it. And those boys are throwing the bales on, throwing the bales on. And we get almost to the top of it. And that tractor, that blasted tractor starts spinning the wheels. The, the ground was loose, it was dry and loose and soft. And those back wheels were just digging a hole in the ground. And, uh, and D. Wolf, the owner, he said, Clutch it, Rick. Well, I clutched it, and it felt like it was going to roll backwards, so I popped the clutch back out. Whoom! <laughs> 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 we're going forward, I mean fast, like a drag race. D. is holding on to the back of the wagon. There's a wooden tailgate on the back, and all that hay is in front of him, and this tractor is going up the hill this way, and I pop the clutch. D's holding on to that wooden tailgate, and when I popped the clutch, all of that hay came backwards, and the tailgate and all landed right on top of D. We ran back there. I don't know how I got that tractor killed. I can't remember that. <laughs> I think I turned the key off or something. And we all ran back there. We're looking for D. He's, you can't see him. He's under, under that tailgate, and he's under about 50 bales of hay. And I said, D, D, are you, I'm in there, I'm under here. And we dug him out, threw that tailgate off of him. D, are you all right? He said, just let me breathe for a minute. (laughs) He lived through it, but I thought I wouldn't. (laughs) You know what happened though? Being scrawny and unable to do the job that those bigger boys were doing, I tried my best. When it came meal time, the farmer's wife would always feed us dinner. I mean, we had pinto beans and cornbread and chicken and dumplings and sliced ripe garden tomatoes and fried okra 
and uh, mashed potatoes. And Anybody getting hungry yet? <laughs> and I got fed the same thing they got fed. I didn't do the work that they did, but I got fed. And when the evening came and he paid us, I got paid just the same as all those other boys. Probably didn't deserve it. Wasn't able to do that. But his philosophy was, you were out there in the heat all day. You were doing the best you could. You're going to be paid just like those other boys. And that's what David said here. He said, look, you guys that think you did all the work, these guys back here is worth something too. And we're sharing with them just the same. That's a gracious king who's following a gracious God. We learn from David about how to encourage ourselves, how to rise from the ruins of discouragement. So how do you do it? Seek God's guidance. Realize that where God guides, He provides. And thirdly, be a channel of grace. Do for others. Respect others. Give grace to others. Whether they measure up exactly like you or not. I always feel like I've been given some extra grace when I'm around other preachers. When I got invited to preach in Oklahoma City, I felt like he could have got anybody that would have done a better job for his church than asking me to preach. But he treated me with respect and dignity, told me what a blessing that I was to them. And whether I was or wasn't, I'll let another judge, but I do know this. I got treated as well as if I'd have been a nationally known preacher coming there to preach for them. God has gifted everybody to do something. We all ought to do something. And we ought to treat others like they've done something. Sometimes God has to bring hardship into our life. Like he brought to David. David had left his allegiance to his homeland of Israel and linked up with those enemy Philistines. God didn't want him there, but even as God chastised him for being in enemy territory, God even used that to bring glory to himself and to strengthen and encourage David because three days later, guess what happened? Three days later, another guy comes into the camp and reports that King Saul is dead. Now, David, you've been anointed. Now you've been encouraged. Now you've been strengthened. And now after going through this with the Amalekites and recovering all that was stolen from you, going through this hardship, David, has made you ready. Now you can move to Hebron and take over the throne and begin your reign as the greatest king of Israel. Sometimes God lets you suffer something for your good. And you come out better on the other side, prepared to do a greater work for the Lord. Encourage yourself. Rise from the ruins of despair and discouragement. Don't stay there looking at the rubble. Get up and seek God's guidance and go do what God said to do. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as a church and as individuals. Lord, help us not to sit and cast blame or deny, to deny others their rightful partnership. Help us not to just look on the ruins as though there were no hope. Lord, help us to look to you to be encouraged and strengthened for our next step in our Christian life. We pray that you encourage somebody tonight who's having a hard time. We pray you just give them strength and hope to go forward tomorrow with a renewed effort as they seek your will and they seek your power. And as they get your direction and your provision, I pray that you'd bless in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you'd stand with me, I invite you to come. If you need to come to this altar and pray, maybe there's something you need to ask the Lord about. <coughs> Why don't you just come? Maybe somebody either on the internet or in this room is thinking, you know, <coughs> I've had some hardships and I've been discouraged. But God's word has given me encouragement tonight and I'm just going to give God the glory maybe somebody's not saved and they need to just say dear Lord 
I don't want to go to hell because of my sin. I know there's no other way to be saved but by trusting Christ. And tonight I place my faith, my trust, my belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary to forgive my sins. I trust him tonight as my Savior. Change me, make me a new believer, a new Christian, a new creature in Christ. If you'll ask him and mean it from your heart, he'll do it. Whatever your need, won't you come?